is Paul Briscoe, who's going to cover the subject of under the hood applications regarding SG2110 and NMOS. And Paul, take it away. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I want to talk about an activity underway at SIMTI. Uh, it's a new project uh, we're undertaking to accommodate perhaps a predictably at least, uh, future applications for metadata. This project is called the ST2110-41 project, or FMX Fast Metadata. Um, this is active SIMPTI project work, so I have to be a little careful about what I talk about because SIMPTI work is confidential. I cannot disclose the details of that activity, but I can disclose what we're doing and discuss some of the ideas that have been input into the process. So, Metadata is a necessary evil. I can show you the scars on my own back from metadata on both sides of the fence throughout my career. Um, it exists everywhere. We acquire it when we acquire the content, and it, metadata makes its way through the process all the way to consumption. There's many types, there's many applications, and it comes and goes throughout the process as well. There's no closed captioning during acquisition. Uh, there's no slate information going home, right? Um, 2110 lives in the same application space as SDI. We're replacing SDI ultimately with 2110, and the hybrid error is upon us. And we've designed 2110 for easy migration to and from SDI. Now, SDI has very robust metadata in ST291. We've used it for years. It works very, very well. It came from the ST era. Uh, it uses the horizontal and vertical ancillaries for transport and registers uh, applications in the SMPTE registry authority. So it's a very robust and very successful metadata method. What is metadata? Well, it's the data that provides information about some other data. And for us, that other data is usually video and audio. Um, some metadata is necessary in order to use that, that actual video and audio information. Uh, other stuff is nice to have information with optional use. And some metadata is static and persistent, never changes, it's always there. Other metadata is dynamic and continuously changing, something like time code or closed captioning. Other metadata, incidentally, can be essence. Uh, things like closed captioning and haptic tactile are not metadata, they're actually essence. Um, and they're just simply masquerading as metadata because it's the easiest way to move it around in our video and audio system. So metadata characteristics, it's temporally bound uh, to the video essence in the case of SD291, frame accurately. It's added at the center and used selectively by the receivers, so whatever you receive, you take out what you want and you ignore the rest. And there's many applications. Some are intended only for internal use within a production. Uh, it's, for example, time code. Other metadata is meant to go right to the home to be consumed, something like closed captioning. Some metadata comes and goes throughout the workflow and some obviously gets lost, it always does. Um, and managing facility metadata is a challenge. Um, legacy metadata is really simple. Um, it's sufficient for the SDI era, it's non-interactive, and it uses very simple data context. 2110 metadata will become rich. Over time, we're gonna do more and more with metadata, and it, it will be a much more interactive environment. Our technology has evolved. So the problem we're going to solve, SIMPTI always has a problem statement to drive a project, and the SIMPTI problem that we solve says, the 2110 suite does not include a method for time-aware transport of SD, uh, non-SD291 metadata. Now, the SD291 metadata standards are intended for SDI, and they're insufficient for applications that need a large amount of metadata. And many current and future 2110 applications would benefit from a new metadata standard that was not constrained to the limitations of SD291, could support rich and arbitrary metadata payloads, and could offer time-aware transport using the SMPTE 2110-10 model. So t today, 21140 transmits SD291. It's very simple how it works. The sender prepares a packet. The sender wraps the entire ancillary payload in IP for transport, and then we transport these ancillary packets over IP on one or more multicast group IP addresses. They may use one address per service, or they may group the uh, services within one IP address. We synchronize using dash 10 to a given video frame. A receiver then unwraps the container, unwraps the SDI element inside that container, and uses it, or places it back into the SDI domain for use in SDI. Um, it's a two-step abstraction, and it's not very pleasant, but it's a very excellent bridge from the old world to the new world because we have a hybrid error where we have to go to and from SDI for quite some time. Um, but it's limited by what 291 can do. Here's what 291 does. This is the actual payload that's transported. And look in here, there's our, I should be using the pointer. Can I get the pointer over there? I can't. I've highlighted in blue the pieces that are actually the ST291 payload. That's right out of SDI. We're simply wrapping it in IP. 
So there's challenges then with 291. Um, but when we use it in 21.10.40, there's some really significant challenges. One of them is uh, we can put one or more ancillary payloads into a Dash 40 packet. There's really no rules. So do you put one service in each 41 stream, excuse me, Dash 40 stream? Well, that's IP address hungry. Or do you group services into one or more streams? And if they're glued together, how do you add or remove one, like in SDI, where we have, for example, a marked for deletion service? Um, also, the technology horizon is in view. This is another motivator. SDI is going away, so we don't want to build new metadata on the old technology. And we don't need backwards compatibility with much future metadata. It will never go back into an SDI system. Um, it's also kind of inefficient to double wrap something for transport. We're doing it because it gives us a very excellent path of transition. Uh, it's also, for example, why we use AES67 instead of simply using 21.10.31 to transport AES3, which we could do, but we don't want to do. It's just not the most efficient and elegant way to do design. And the worst part about 291 is it only supports 291 ancillary services. And these are simple, small-scale services. And it consumes one or more IP addresses per stream. And we'd like to preserve IP addresses wherever we can. So in handling new 21.10 metadata, we get there via ANTS. Um, so we define an SD291 application for this data in the, for, in the 2110 domain. We still would def be defining a dash, uh, excuse me, a 291 application, registering it, and then wrapping it and wrapping it in another dash 40. Does it fit the constraints of 291? How do we adapt it? Do we need to do any funny business to accommodate? If it's bigger than one SDI ancillary payload, do we concatenate two or three of them? Uh, there's a lot of questions that way. We're doing it this way because it's a natural first step for these hybrid systems. So the fast metadata proposal then is for the rapid time-aware delivery of arbitrary metadata streams in concert with a media stream or not. Use a standardized encoding method for transport that's extensible and consistent. We don't consume additional IP addresses if we can. We want this to be payload agnostic. We can transport anything inside this. We can synchronize it with the media streams if we wish using dash 10. We can support legacy 291 services if we want. And it's media stream agnostic, so we can use any time aware stream to associate it with. And we can also use it as an independent data channel, just transmit it unassociated with anything and use it as a means to move data across the 2110 network. Oh, and no changes to any other 2110 documents in the course of defining this new standard. There's the project statement. If you want to see it, you can get download the printed version of this and have a look. I'm not going to read it, but it describes explicitly what we're doing at SIMPTE. So, what 2110.41 is going to do is use a consistent data structure such as a KLV type structure, key length value, a simple way to encode data. It's a very well-known representation. It's extensible. Uh, it's optionable and scalable, and it's easily parsable. It, it carries just the net naked metadata. There's no additional wrapping involved. And then it delivers at a specific time, in concert with a video frame or even before that. Um, we can use a real or predicted timestamp with it to deliver it when we want to deliver it, in fact. And early delivery means early processing. So if, in fact, it's something that has to affect the next frame of video, we can deliver it in advance of that frame of video so that the processing can occur to respond to it in time to deliver that processed frame of video. And you can use it on its own with no associated stream. Arbitrary data transport, system level or bulletins just simply sent periodic like, like ATIS uh, in, in flying. So what does it enable? Well, we can carry new payload types. We can carry data structures uh, such as XML and JSON or whatever we want inside one of these things. So there's been some argument, should we do a JSON, should we do an XML? If we do a KLV structure, we can put either one inside. Um, we, we can carry arbitrary metadata we haven't even dreamed of yet. And that's the whole point of the standard is when we come to a point in some application in the future where we want metadata, we have a bucket to put it in. Hopefully it'll help address conservation as you'll see in a minute. And it's a cleaner way, we think, to carry today's ancillary services. It'll overcome the limitations of Dash 40. We could still use the existing registry and DID SDI structure of 291 if we wish. Um, and the metadata payload in that case would be identical, just not wrapped for SDI. So the methodology then is fairly simple. We'll transport it associated with a 2110 stream, use the same IP address as the stream, and then we'll use a different UDP port number to differenti differentiate the metadata stream. This is how we would preserve addresses. So the video could have three metadatas attached all on the same multicast group with different port numbers to identify the metadata stream. 
far as the wrapping, we use a generic TLV KLV. We don't want to use SMPTE 336. SMPTE 336 is a, a wonderful, rich uh, KLV tool set, but it has uh, a lot of baggage attached. And we really don't need the things attached to it uh, that were attached for other purposes, but we will like to use that kind of structure. It's payload agnostic, wide no widely known, well known and widely used. So a blob and a blob, we're gonna use two KLV-like wrappers, and I said we weren't gonna double wrap it, and well, maybe I'm lying a little, but we're not double wrapping for no good reason. Um, there's an outer wrapper, and it's a boxcar. We're gonna move that across the network like a boxcar. Like a boxcar, inside that is gonna be containers, and those containers, um, Oh, we can carry, I'm sorry. I apologize, this stupid thing <laughs> turned out to be in reveal mode one at a time. Maybe I'll go ahead and do this. Um, so we can carry one or more of them. As I mentioned, you can attach several of these uh, blobs to a video stream. And then each one will have an inner wrapper. And that inner wrapper now will contain the actual metadata, which, and this inner wrapper will be specifically designed for the application. But it's still just another RTP stream. So we're gonna use that same multicast address on a new port number, like like is used for FEC, for example. And then the RTP timestamps will be in the same units as the media stream. Okay, we'll be using a 90, 90 kilohertz clock uh, for video FMX packets. If we were attaching them to audio, we'd use a 48K clock and so on. And if the metadata has a time relationship to the media, then the timestamp will indicate how that relates. And the FMX packets are in the outer protocol format. So it's a familiar design, should look fairly fairly familiar to anybody who knows about 2110. Um, we're gonna use a regular RTP transport with a 16-bit sequence number. Uh, and the timestamp, as I said, is gonna be in units of the media clock associated with this metadata, if there's one associated. And we have extensibility through using KLV. Um, we will have a defined namespace structure for keys to allow experimental and private user keys in addition to standardized and registered keys. Um, the KLV blobs will fit inside a packet. If there's fragmentation involved, it will span multiple packets and the inner protocol will handle the fragmentation. They're 32-bit aligned, because that's the way we do things nowadays. Byte aligning is very passe. And any padding to achieve alignment is also gonna be the responsibility of the inner protocol, the inner blob. Um, so at 10 bits, we'll get 32, uh, excuse me, the number of 32 bits that, that follow. And then that leaves us 22 bits for the identifier four million possibilities for an identifier. So it's a rich addressing space we can use with this. When we map these arbitrary payloads into blobs, well, if the payload is small enough to fit within a single blob, we just drop it in. The registration of the, of the actual metadata type can indicate that. If the payload requires fragmentation, a registration can explain how that's done. Uh, we could use Dash 41's method in Appendix A. We could use the payload document, or pilot private payloads, in fact, don't need to disclose what they do we can actually consider accommodating private payloads using this standard. The uh, method in Dash 41 Appendix A uh, simplifies mapping existing payloads into this system without needing yet another specification. Fragmentation, again, words in this drawing, the number of 10-bit words in this blob, the identifier is the identifier of the contents, um, and then the blob is a fixed header plus a partial payload, and I won't drag you through the details of this, again, you can look, but we can transport objects up to two gigabytes in length with this scheme without any modification whatsoever. What's in the blobs? Well, every kind of data needs some document to describe how it's structured, so private data is the exception to that. One example we have for this project is Dash 42, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, shortly. That's the technical metadata associated with a stream. It could be elements of the SDP and it could be other technical met metadata related to the stream that is not contained in the SDP. It could be production related data for that matter too. Um, to register a Dash 41 ID, we think what we need to do is register things like an ID, which simply would allocate. Uh, we need a title, obviously. We need company contact information. The usual thing is actually not that much different from registering an ANT service in SD291. Example registrations then could be things like 2109 audio metadata. We've actually had a request to consider how to handle this. 2110-42 uh, technical metadata, as I just described. Uh, or Joe's secret magic private data, as uh, John Myatt came up with. Uh, it could be totally applicable to somebody's system. It will never leave their system. And this metadata could be carried on our system here as well. Do we need buffer models? Now, we can't really ignore the need for buffer models. Um, 
Metadata associated with an existing stream must be included in the buffer modeling of that stream. It's on that multicast group. It's part of the data volume of that stream. So we have to be sure we include the metadata that's being used in the buffer model when we calculate that. Metadata which isn't associated with an existing stream still must pass a CMAX model uh, compatibility model. Similar to what's defined in 21, with the following parameters. Our good old beta of 1.1, 90% link loading, and then a T drain based on that and a CMAX of four. That's at least our guess right now. SDP, dash 41 streams associated with a media stream should somehow be signaled in the SDP of the associated stream. I don't think we know the answer to that yet. Maybe it's just another FMT parameter of the listing ID, uh, or maybe it's ID import offset if it's not default. Dash 41 streams which stand alone will require their own SDP like an essence stream, as any essence stream does. So for parameters and values from the past, we'll define the key value representations in the Dash 42 document. For new documents written after this standard is published, we will expect that standard to contain the information necessary for new keys and any new values to be used. We did this in 2059. We can only describe the standards we knew up to the point of publication of 2059, and we have a little bit of weasel word in there that says, by the way, if you do something new in the future, that document shall contain the information that would have been in 2059 had that existed when we wrote 2059. So there would be continuity for all the necessary data, but it would no longer be in the Dash 41 document. It would then be within the documents that are using Dash 41 after its publication date. Oops. So in, 20, in parallel, let me show you my slide here. Um, I mentioned that we were talking about transporting technical metadata. It's going to be standard called Dash 42 and we call it carriage of 2110 uh, technical metadata, and it's the associated sender SDP data, some or all of that data, and some additional useful technical data about the stream. Uh, this is not intended to re replace ISO 4. ISO 4 is a rich ecosystem. It's a reliable and robust mechanism. Instead, we're trying to provide something in band as an alternative for use in certain cases. It could, for example, enable a very simple system of a camera feeding a monitor where there is no registry available, all you would need is the multicast group address of the sender, pull up the stream, and you have all of the technical metadata required to decode and use the stream arrive on the next video frame boundary. The project status, well, right now the proposals have been discussed initially. The project is underway in, uh, in the SBIP group, um, and the proposals have been discussed, and we've expanded on the concepts, and we're looking at some other immediate applications besides what I've mentioned. Uh, and we'll begin document drafting fairly soon. The technical me metadata project uh, has also been approved and we haven't moved ahead on that. Uh, there's really no need to move ahead on that until we have a good framework for the actual transport mechanism. So in summary, like the 291 metadata before, 211041 offers a custom fit method of transporting temporarily aligned metadata in 2110 systems. We can augment or we can replace ultimately 291 as applicable. It offers immense data space capa uh, capabilities, something we don't have today in 291. And in the future, we can now dream of things like selling, I don't know, a teleprompter script down, the, down this link. There's no reason it goes one way or the other. It's a data channel that we can use for many things. And hopefully this will enable new metadata applications we don't even think of in SDI, where we send the metadata around the SDI because SDI simply can't do the job. So if you have any ideas, if you'd like to help, please join us in our work on the SD2110 uh, drafting group, and we much appreciate your help. And thank you. And oh. any questions you might have, be happy to take them. Yes, thank you for, your, for sharing with us your views of uh, the standards work around metadata for 2110. And uh, are there any questions from the audience? Two metadata guys in the audience right here, and they don't have a question, so that might give me a pass. Oh, here we oh, go. Oh, I was just going to say, I did have no. a question. We, I think we missed too many of the slides to have an intelligent question. <laughs> That's okay. That, you're a plant. You know what goes on anyway, so. All right. Well, thank you very thank much, you. Paul. It's been a pleasure. Cheers. Thank, thank you. you.